So Revelation chapter 13 verse 11 is where we pick up this morning. And uh, interestingly enough, today we're just going to jump right in. I'm going to share with you what we're going to be talking about. Uh, we're going to be talking about the false prophet. Uh, it's a character in Scripture, the person in Scripture that we learn of that is going to come on the scene and is going to wreak, if you will, um, great havoc on the world. And one of the reasons why I believe that's the case is because, quite honestly, he's not a person that we talk about very often. Um, we talk a lot about the Antichrist, right? And we talk a lot about Satan, but we don't really spend a lot of time focused on the person of the false prophet. And I think he likes it that way. I, I think he likes kind of slipping in under the radar. Not many people know what he's about or what he's going to do. It's interesting that as we'll see in the scriptures today, that when we look at this person known as the false prophet, and there's a lot of talk about the mark of the beast and the, the, the mark of the Antichrist, right? And, and a lot of people just assume that this is something that the Antichrist is going to implement. We actually discover in scripture that this is a policy and a practice that the false prophet actually implements and drops, okay? And it's again the reason. I believe he's able to do so and do so, so successfully because not many people are looking at his direction. Not many, many people are assuming that he's somebody to worry about. I want to share with you a story, if I can, uh, from my own personal life. Um, for most of you guys know that I work with exotic animals, and some of those exotic animals happen to be venomous. Okay? I work with venomous snakes, right? Cobras and rattlesnakes and gila lizards and all those kind of scary scary animals, right? And because we do, the facility that we work at, it has to have a sign, okay? There's a sign above the facility as you walk into it, as well as a sign above the specific room where those dangerous animals are being kept. And the sign says, dangerous animals. Big warning sign, right? And what that warning sign basically means to anybody walking into the facility and anybody specifically walking into the room is that this is not a place to play, as we like to refer to in my house, stupid games, okay? You don't fool around in the venomous room, right? You don't mess around, you don't just open up things carelessly. And the reason being is because there are things there that could kill you, right? You say, Pastor Ryan, this isn't very biblically enlightened, this is just common sense, right? But so too, there are things in our lives that the Lord warns us, you don't play with them. Stay far away from those things. And in fact, as we talked about before, the mark of the beast is one of those things. God says you should have no part in that mark, okay? He's warning the people that will be left behind on planet Earth after the rapture of the church that, hey, listen, this is not something to fool around with. I was struggling this uh, this week, to be honest with you guys, to put together this, this uh, study because one of the things that was... What's tough for me was, you know what, this isn't an area of scripture where I could start off and open up with like a funny story. There's not a lot of funny stories to kind of inject into the, the text here. There's not a lot of applicable things. There's not, I was just struggling to put together that opening, you know, the one that would get everybody kind of hooked in and be like, yeah, this is going to be a great message. And, and I shared that with my wife. I said, baby, you got to help me eyes out. And I said, you got to help me put together. I need a story or something to open up with. And she goes, well, maybe this isn't one of those teachings where you have to open up with such a story. Maybe, in fact, by doing so, you actually might minimize the severity of what God is trying to talk about here. It's interesting, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 20 and 21, Paul writes to Timothy. And he writes to Timothy, and he writes to Timothy with a sense of urgency. He says, oh, Timothy. There's an exclamation point, meaning like, dude, listen up here. Oh, Timothy, guard what was committed to your to your trust, avoiding the profane and idle babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. By professing it, some straight concerning the faith. Grace be with you. Amen. As I said before, today we're going to be talking about the false prophet. And as we look at the false prophet and we look for those, those things which would give us some sort of application from the text, right, for our own lives, one of the things I want us to take away is what are some of those marks, if you will, of deception that the enemy will try to mark our lives with or, or, or mark our walk with the Lord with, okay? How will the enemy try to mark up our walk, if you will, with the Lord? What are those some of those deceiving marks? If you're taking note, let's look at verse 11. It says, Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. This is again speaking of the false prophet. Saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. 
you're taking note, one of the first things that we are to do away with is the broken scales and the wrong measures, all right? So that's what we mean by that, broken scales and wrong measures. Well, it says here in the scripture that the false prophet will come up, and what will he do to our lamb? But here's the problem. He's going to speak like a dragon. And where is he going to come up from? But he's going to come up from the earth. Meaning that his wisdom and his spirituality isn't really heavenly in nature, but it's earthly. It's the wisdom of this world. And God warns us here that we are not to presume or to measure the standards of holiness according to the way the false prophet does things, according to his sense of spirituality. In other words, he has all the right jargon. He knows all the Christianese language, right? He might even have some really cool bumper stickers or some Jesus Saved Pro t-shirt, right? He might, he might look the part, but the problem is, is all of his information and all that he really possesses in his heart, where does it come from? It comes from the enemy. It comes from the dragon. And his wisdom comes from his world. In Galatians chapter 1, verse 6 and 10, it says this, I marvel, Paul writes this to the church in Galatia, I marvel that you're turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another. Just because it says gospel on it doesn't mean that it's the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Just because somebody's telling you it's good news doesn't mean that it's actually the good news which comes from our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says, I marvel. I'm blown away by the fact that you're turning so quickly to another gospel just because it sounds nice to you in the moment. He says, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if, watch this guys, even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be a curse that word means condemned to hell. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be a curse. For, I, for do I now persuade men or God? That's the question Paul's asking. He's saying, listen, is it my job to make you like God more? Is it my job to persuade you? Or is it my job to honor God? That's the question that we have to ask ourselves. Listen, I understand that the message of the gospel for a lot of people today is it, too, what's the word, it's too closed-minded, right? It, it, it's not broad enough for the liking of, of most of the world. It's, it, it's, not, it's not what people want to hear. It doesn't put on the kind of show that people want to see. And Paul says, listen, I don't care how many people go there. I don't care how good of a speaker the person is that gives this message. I don't care what kind of authority they have. I don't care if they're a ruler, or they're a president, or if they're a popular preacher on TV. I don't care who they are. If anybody comes to you preaching another gospel, an alternative way, a message that is contradictory to God's message, he says, let them be a curse. No place for that in God's house, amongst God's people. Second Peter. Chapter 2, verse 18 says, For when they speak great, strong words of emptiness. I like that, right? It, it, it almost sounds contradictory. They speak these great, swelling words. And you know what's on the inside? Same, same contents of a balloon. Nothing but hot air, right? It doesn't mean anything. I don't know about you guys. Sometimes I struggle with that. I'll listen to some people talk about spirituality. They'll say a lot of spiritual things. They'll string together a lot of adjectives and really cool words. Sometimes they're even big words and they do a better job than I ever could. And I listen to them and I walk away going, what did they just actually say? I have no idea what they're actually talking about. I have no idea what it is that they're trying to say. He says, for when they speak great telling words of emptiness, they allure through the lust of their flesh. Through rudeness, the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error. As here's the problem is that when we use those broken scales and the systems of measurements, right? When we assess the Lord according to the world standard, when we assess the Messiah, when we assess His Word according to the world standard, what we're actually doing is we're just doing so according to the lust of our flesh. It's because of what we want to hear. 
It's because what we deserve. I, I don't like that message. I avoid that book in the Bible. I, I don't like when a preacher talks this kind of way. I don't, I don't like hearing that that, that 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 if you don't accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you'll be condemned to hell. That, that doesn't jive well. I, I, Pastor Ryan, listen, great message today. I'm not going to share this one online. You know, I got too many friends and family. They hear you talking about going to hell. They hear you talking about God having a standard. No way, man. I ain't going to go. I'm going to lose Facebook friends. I can't afford that right now. All right? I've already lost enough. Listen, what's the standard? Is it God's standard that we're using? Or is it the world's standard? Number two. Note this about the false prophet. It says, and he exercises all authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Let me take a quick water break. The false prophet, he uses authority, he uses power, he loves power, and he uses it for personal gain. What about you and me? Do we love to be the person that gets to make the final call? Do we love to be the person that gets noted? Do we want to see our, our names on buildings or on stars on the sidewalk? I mean, may, maybe that's too, maybe that's not your aspiration. But let's be honest for a moment. Don't you just love to have a Don't you love when people look to you and refer to you and go, man, so-and-so knows what the fuck. I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to submit under so-and-so because they're smart. They know what's up, right? And this is behind the false prophet's motivation. He wants to draw people with more followers, and for what purpose? But for personal gain. He wants to draw people to himself that they might be drawn to the enemy. Matthew chapter 23, verse 6 and 7. Jesus warns his disciples using the example of the Pharisees. He says, they love, speaking of the Pharisees, they love the best places of the feast, the best seats in the synagogues, Greetings in the marketplaces and to be called by men, teacher, teacher. In other words, they love it when people recognize them for the great things that they're doing and for all the knowledge and all the wisdom that they have. And the warning to us as believers is that heart should be in us. We should be okay with going unnoticed. We should be okay with maybe only a few people responding to the gospel when we give it out, but that we would not cease from giving it out. We don't change the message for anybody. It doesn't matter how many people show up on Sunday. It doesn't matter how many people show up on Wednesday. It doesn't matter how many people like your posts or share your posts afterwards. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you lose friends, if you lose family. Jesus said that those things will happen if you're somebody that's frequently giving out the truth. Now, again, that doesn't mean you do it in a harsh way. But you do it in love. But let me tell you something. If you don't give it because you say that you love it, you don't love either. There's no compromise in it. You gotta give people the truth because what's coming up on the scene here is a great deceiver. One who will draw people to himself only to draw them to the enemy of their soul. And why? Because what they hunger for is authority, the ability to lord over people, and personal gain. In fact, it's interesting to know when it comes to personal gain and power that nobody in the scriptures who wants to amass this, who exercises that kind of dictatorial um, authority over people, you know, the person who likes to tell people what to do a little too much, right? There's no person in scripture that behaves that way is ever highlighted in a positive sense, right? The person that, that lords over the people, in fact, Jesus in Revelation speaks directly to those people. He says, I don't like those people very much. You want to be one of those people? No, I don't want to be one of those people. Also, it's a warning to us. It's a warning to us not to compromise the truth of God's word for the sake of gaining that authority, right? Or keeping that power. And anybody think of any examples of people who like to keep power? People who say and do just about anything to gain power? I wasn't talking about politicians. That's a good example too. All right, but here's the point, right? Christian, can I be just? I want to be 100 percent transparent and honest. Why is it that politicians who we support and like all of a sudden get a buy when it comes to the standard? Right? We, when we support somebody, will say that those people, if we support them again, 
we'll, we'll look for the fact that maybe one time or two times or three times they talk about the Bible or they say that they're Christians and we hold them accountable to no other standard of Christian faith. Okay? It, it doesn't matter how many times they've been married or remarried, cheated on spouses. It doesn't matter if they don't go to church on a regular basis. It doesn't matter if they make customs swear a whole bunch or if their policies are contrary to biblical standards of righteousness and truth. None of that matters. Why? Well, because they have the little R or the little D or the little I next to their name. And I like those people with those, with those letters next to their name. And as long as they say they're a Christian once, it doesn't matter. Right? We've had politicians, and I have people that are, that are supported by the church, and they're not even believers. And just because they say that they're believers, they could be a part of a cult, a whole other group of people, unbelievers. But you know what? They have the letter next to them, and we believe them. Why? We have a standard for that that sort of thing, and it's God's word. And I, and listen, I'm not saying that we shouldn't encourage, I'm not saying that we shouldn't witness, I'm not saying that we shouldn't submit under governing authorities, any of those things. What I'm saying is, is that it looks kind of silly when we support people like that, okay, and compromise our standard of truth because it fits our narrative and what we want, politically speaking, right? So too, listen, God holds us accountable. We shouldn't be a people that's going to compromise God's standard just because it means the something. Continuing on. Verse 13. It says, He performs great signs so that He even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. This is a false prophet. Now here's something that, that for some may blow your mind. Did you know that Satan knows how to perform miracles and tricks as well? I mean, you just read it prior week, right? When it talks about the Antichrist having a mortal wound and then being healed from that mortal wound afterwards, right? You guys remember the story of Moses when he brought when he went before Pharaoh and he performed certain signs and wonders, all right? And he would perform actually the air and perform a sign and wonder. They throw down a staff and turn into a snake. And guess what? The enemies of God, the Egyptians, the magicians, right? They would throw down a staff and it would also turn into a snake. You go, wait a second, I didn't know it was taking it. Absolutely. This is the false prophet comes on the scene and he'll perform signs. In other words, the warning for us as believers is that we shouldn't be following the glitz and the glamour. Just because it's shiny doesn't mean that it's good for you, right? It might be a hook, right? Just because somebody, as we talked about before, just because they have a really big following, just because a lot of people like them, doesn't mean that we should take what they say without consulting and confirming it in God's word. The false prophet comes on the scene and he seems by all accounts to be a spiritual man. And in fact, we know that both him and the, and the Antichrist, they'll have some, some, um, some connection to even the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem, right? So they'll have a connection to this. The problem is, is that at some point, they flip the script and they say, hey, instead of worshiping God, they're going to worship us instead. They're going to worship the beast and the image of the beast instead. Right? But, but wait a second, you did such great things. And how many times have I heard this? You know, so-and-so can't be so bad. Do you know how many people they've led to the Lord? So-and-so can't be so bad. Do you know how many, how much they give to charity? You know how good, the, you know all the good things? Yeah. Is that the standard? Right? Is it, is it altruism? Is it how much you can give to charity? Right? I, I, I've said before, are we measuring on the basis of success? Is that the? Is it how much money is in their bank account that determines whether or not they're, they're good with the Lord? I've said before, I, you know, when he was alive, I mean, Hugh Hefner must have been in great standing with the Lord. He had a lot of money and a lot of people liked him. I guess, I guess he was great, right? No, but I can't believe you would say something. That's pretty despicable. How can you... But, but we measure other people according to the same standard regardless of whether or not they're actually walking with the world or they're holding to sound doctrine. See, that's the standard. It's not whether I like them. I, listen, I like a lot of people that aren't believers. I get along with the people that aren't believers. Sometimes better than some Christians, right? But that's not the standard of what oh, Pastor Ryan likes them, so I guess they're good with God. Yeah, that's not the standard. It's the question of whether or not they're good with, with God. Is, is God saying that he's good with that? 
Uh, have they given their life over to Christ as he commands in the scriptures? Have they believed in the Lord Jesus Christ that he's their God and he's their Savior? That he died on the cross for their sins and that he rose three days later? That's the standard, my friends. Don't be deceived. Just because it's special, it's big, it's loud, it's cool, it must be God. You know, a friend of mine, I've shared this story before, but I think it's probably to share again. A friend of mine decided one year he's going to create this MMA line brand of clothing, okay? And it was cool looking, right? It, it was these two guys that were kind of grappling and fighting, and it had all that Japanese artwork, like that feudal kind of like samurai artwork on there. It was really cool. And then it had a bunch of Japanese letters. And so when he was having the shirts designed, he said to the person that were designing it, he says, listen, I, I just need something cool, something, you know, a bunch of different words, like say, like uh, warrior. He gave him a bunch of different words to use on the shirt, but he wanted all in Japanese lettering, right? This is cool, you know, for sure, being, you know, samurais on the front and brand name. Anyways, one day he goes to the gym wearing this cool new shirt, right? And there's a guy there from Japan, and he's, uh, he, he's there training, and he's uh, actually a judo black belt. And, and his uh, buddy walks into the gym, and he's wearing this cool new shirt with all the Japanese lettering on it. The guy looks at him and he goes, ha ha, happy new year to you too. And he goes, what? He goes, looks at his shirt and he points. Happy new year, happy new year, happy new year, happy new year, happy new year. See, the point was is that he thought he was having something cool put on him, and all it actually said in Japanese was happy new year. Right? The point is, we can be deceived. Just because something looks cool and looks good, it doesn't mean that it's actually what we desire. It doesn't mean what the Lord desires either. You know, you can put a Christian bumper sticker on your vehicle, right? It doesn't mean that you're, you're driving for the Lord, right? You can wear a Christian t-shirt. doesn't mean that you know anything about Jesus. You could, you could stamp a, a Christian label on any organization or business. It doesn't mean that you're conducting yourself in a way that brings glory and honor to the Lord. You, know, you could say a lot of Christian words. It doesn't mean that you know Christ. You can even say His name. You know, there's a lot of people that say God, Jesus, and even in the right context. doesn't mean they know Him. Matthew, Matthew chapter 16, verse 1 through 4, says, And the Pharisees and Sadducees came, and testing him, asked that he would show them a sign from heaven. He answered and said to them, When it is evening, you say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red, and in the morning it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and red. Hypocrites. In other words, they're changing. You know, one day the red sky means good, the next day the red sky means bad. You know, they, the, the goalpost is moving, they're constantly changing the meaning, right? What suits them at the moment? He said, You're a hypocrite. You know how to discern the face of the sky, but you can't discern the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign shall be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah, and he left them and departed. And we can get into that text a little bit further. We'll probably do so at another time, but here's the point I want us to glean from that text. is Jesus says it's a wicked person that looks solely on the outside of something without discerning what's really going on internally, the intent or the, the spirit behind what's leading them. He says, you just want to see something nice, right? You get, you, you're, you're impressed by what the outside looks like just because it's pretty. Jesus even said the whitewashed tombs, he calls it the Pharisees. He says, you're whitewashed tombs. They look nice on the outside. But guess what's inside? Death. It's just bones. Is that what you really want to be known for? It's the wrong heart. It's the wrong heart that looks at the Lord and says, God, it's your job to impress me. It's the wrong heart that looks at the church and the people of God and says, you know what, it's your job. It's your job to impress me. Keep my attention. Do something cool. Perform a sign. Perform a miracle. Then I'll believe. Then I'll follow you. You what, Pastor Ryan, you talked this past weekend about the walk of faith, the venture of faith. Well, I'd venture on faith, but you know, the Lord's got to do a little bit more for me. He's got to show up a little bit more. I, I, I needed to work out. The, I've tried that venture of faith before. It didn't quite work out the way I wanted it to. My expectation was A, God delivered B. And so therefore, I don't do that anymore. I judge solely on the outside. He says, that's a perverse and wicked thing to do. Just because you discern or you understand a certain thing about a situation, you presume whether or not it's from God or not, do that according to you for it. Moving on to verse 14. 
says, and he deceived those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who is wounded by the sword and live. So the false prophet, he comes on the scene, he performs signs, he performs miracles, he captures the audience, he gains their attention, and he slips in very seductively to go say, listen, what we're going to do now, we're going to build a monument. We're going to go ahead and build a statue, an altar. And many people believe that this is quite possibly a reference to that which is spoken of or known as the, the abomination of desolation. It's a, it's a, a, a title of the beast of Satan inside the temple of God. All right? But here is also the application and the point for us, the warning for us, that we would not create a God of our own liking or of our own desire. Isn't that how the enemy slips in? He first creates a disgruntled Christian. I, I don't know if I agree with that. I don't know if I like that standard that God has. I don't, I, I, I don't know if I like that idea. And, and, and as he does it, you know what the enemy starts to do? We're into, well, well, surely that's not what, who God is. That's not what he means. Right? Does that sound familiar? Book of Genesis, maybe? As, as Eve explains to the serpent, hey, this is what God's standard is. He says, no, 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 surely you won't die. But here's the interesting thing. As, as she looks to recreate God and, and what he says according to what she desires and according to the, the lies of the enemy, guess what happens? What the enemy is actually speaking to her heart is, that's a liar. Surely you won't die. Right? Isn't that just a nice way of saying he lied to you? I mean, he wants to keep back. He, he just knows that in the day that you eat of it, you'll be wise like him. You know what the that says? He's trying to keep good stuff from you. He doesn't have your best interest in mind, does he? Right? Well, it doesn't sound as appetizing as that's offered in that life. Of course, the Bible also warns us that Satan doesn't show up with the horns of the pitchfork. You know what he looks like? An angel of life. Right? The doctrines of demons, right? Isn't that what that starts to sound like here, guys? That's our warning. That as believers, we wouldn't be so quickly inclined to create a God after our own image. Deception works often best under spiritual guise, under noble intentions, and under altruism. I shared this with everybody this week on social media at times. Post. I think I took it from some of you. Maybe it was somebody at the church and was talking to you. I'll give you credit. But it was this picture of a guy sweating for pieces, right? And it says, and above it, in the caption, it says, that moment when you realize the prosperity gospel, right, offers the same things that Satan offered Jesus, right, in the, in the wilderness. It's that moment when you realize, and you listen, I've spoken out against the prosperity gospel for a long time. That idea that you believe in Jesus and you thank the for it. You believe in Jesus and, and life is going to be great. You believe in Jesus and trust Jesus and you'll be healed. You believe in Jesus and your marriage is going to be perfect. Your kids are going to come out perfect. Everything's going to be perfect. You know? And that only really works here in America. Right? I mean, try going to a third world country and sharing this. You're like, yeah, I got bad news for you. Don't work so well over here, right? But here's the reality. Even though we speak out of this, right? Because we're Calvary chapter people, chapter by chapter, book by verse, you know, book by book, verse by verse, right? Do we still believe it a little bit here? Well, you know, Lord, I mean, I was expecting a different truth. Lord, I was expecting, like, when I ventured out into ministry, but you just bless it abundantly. Lord, we're waiting on our building. Lord, come on here. I mean, I'm believing, I'm walking, out. it's hot outside, I need some more water, actually, you know? What's going on, Lord? Lord, not some water, that's the prosperity gospel. Is it the prosperity gospel? But yeah, you just don't, you don't call it that because it doesn't suit you to call it that at the moment, right? Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 1 through 5 through 4. If there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer who journeys, and he gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder comes to pass, of which he spoke to you, saying, Let us go 
go up. He said, let us go after other gods, which we have not known, and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dream last dream, for the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his word. You shall serve him and hold fast to him. But the prophet and the dreamer and dream shall be put to death because he has spoken in order to turn you away from the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of bondage to entice you from the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk. So you shall put away that evil. Put it away. Put away the idea that God owes you something. Put away the idea that you're going to recreate God how you see it. Not according to his word, but according to how you feel in the moment. According to what it is that you desire in the way. In other words, put down the will, right? You ain't you, you here to make a God after your own image. Listen, if God's somebody that we make in our image, that's not a God we're serving. That's scary. You know what that means? That means Ryan's in control. All right? Ryan in control is not a good thing. Right? If I'm calling the shots, we're all in trouble. And any of you guys are calling the shots. Probably better than me, but still, we're in trouble. Moving on. Actually, Matthew chapter 24. Let me say one or two other things on this. One. Matthew chapter 24, verse 24 says, The false Christ and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive if possible, even the elect. Second Timothy tells us why this will happen. It says, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will keep up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to the truth. Because of their itching ears. Because they want to hear something that made them feel better. They wanted to hear an upbeat message, a positive message, one that would make them feel okay with how they're living currently, or the fact that they didn't show up for church when they knew they should have been, or the fact that they're not serving the ministry the way that God called them to, or that they're not sharing the gospel with the lost. They wanted to hear something that would make them feel okay about how they're living, and God says that that's the mark of a false teacher, a false prophet, and that's the mark of a people that's willing to hear such a thing. Whatever it is that will make me feel good. And as soon as I hear something that I don't, man, I'm not moving on. The Lord's called me to a new church, brother. The Lord's called me to a new place. Why? Because they heard something they didn't like. I've often said to some to people, you hear something you don't like, don't take it up with me. I didn't write the book. It was the Lord, right? If you hear something you don't like, take it up with the one who wrote it. That's God. I've heard people say before, only God can judge me. Only God can judge me. Here's the problem with that statement. It presumes that God's judgment somehow differs from what he says according to his word. It presumes that God is not judging on a criteria that's not his word. Here's the problem with that. Here's the problem with that idea that God's not that, that, that only God can judge, and I'm not talking about condemnation here. I'm talking about what the Bible says concerning the scripture. It says that the spiritual man or the spiritual woman appraises all things. The criteria of the Lord is laid out for us in scripture. And as soon as we hear something we don't like and we default to that idea, well only God judges me. Well here's the question that you have to ask yourself. Are you are you certain of how God is judging? Right? Are, are you knowledgeable of the criteria by which God is using to judge whether things are of Him or not of Him? Well, I actually don't know. I just I say that because I hear something that I don't like. And then, listen, you might want to get familiar with the criteria by which He uses. Psalm 119, verse 9 says this How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed, by taking heed according to your word. Verse 15. He has granted power to give breath to the image of the beast. The image of the beast to go to speak, to cause as many as do not worship the image of the beast to be You know what happens too? One of the marks of a false prophet 
as soon as they hear something that they don't like, as soon as they're convicted, as soon as they hear a message that, that doesn't make them feel good about themselves, or doesn't amass to what they begin to do, they begin to attack those who do. They begin to attack those who do hold to God's standard and God's character, maybe directly or indirectly. Guys, listen. Amongst the brethren and the sister of God, amongst the believers, amongst the church, we are not to be attacking one another. It's not a mark of, of sincere faith. It's, it's actually a mark of the enemy. I hate watching that. I hate seeing people inside of stores, online. I was, re- I was reading something a pastor put on, a full read pastor put on, online, okay? Talking about how Christians who don't eat together, Okay, feel ostracized from those who do meet, and, and we're judging each other, and, I'm, and they're putting it on a public platform. For it to be much more, more explained than that online. We shouldn't be tearing each other down online. You know, people taking, arguing, believers arguing online over things that are taking place in the world right now, brothers and sisters fighting against each other. How? Shameful. That's not the mark of the church. That's not the mark of the spirit of God. It's another spirit. We should have no part of that. The skewed perspective. You begin to fight against each other. In 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 17 and 18, it says, And it happened when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said to him, Is that you, O troubler of Israel? And he answered, I've not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house are, but that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and you have followed the Baals. In other words, the skewed perspective causes us to fight against our brothers and sisters in Christ, presuming that they bring trouble, when in reality, it's us not walking with God, who we have called us to do so according to his word. Listen, if you're going to think under persecution and attack, this is what Proverbs says as well. Proverbs 24, verse 10 says, if you think in the day of adversity, your strength is small. And you know what that means? If your strength is small, it means you're not getting strength from the Lord. You're getting strength from the flesh. It's a tough day. It's a little hot outside. I mean, I'm thankful for this day over the, uh, over the, you know, the rain, the downpour, the daily we had last week, at least not the equipment, will get destroyed. But listen, our strength is really small. If our strength in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. That's it. Un, untapped. It, there, there's no exhausting that strength if our strength is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And listen, we shouldn't attack each other either uh, to make ourselves feel better about our choices. Let's continue on. Verse 16 and 17, we're going to be drawn to the open here. Actually, we're going to go back to the start. It says, He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slow, to receive the mark on their right hand and on their forehead. And no one may buy or sell except one who is the mark of the name of the beast or the number of his name. We shouldn't allow lesser things to steal our way to the number. What steals our love? What robs God of the attention and the praise that He is doing in our lives? Is it fear of loss of food, of wealth, of comfort? of hobbies, of lies, of spouses, of children, what would cause us to lose or to take our loyalty from God and put it onto something else? In other words, what then is really the God of your life? First Thessalonians 5.3 says this, For when they say peace and safety, then suddenly destruction comes upon them. As labor teams on a pregnant woman, they shall not escape. The false prophet comes on the scene promising peace, but all he delivers is lies and destruction. What thing in your life is promising you peace that possibly be What thing in your life is robbing God the praise and the glory that he's deserving for the sake of maybe some greater peace? It's less hassle, it's less frustration, right? You know, it's interesting those words and research on the mark of disease. 
right? We know according to scripture that those that take the mark of the beast, that they're able to buy and sell and trade. In other words, life gets to continue on as normal as possible, right? There's peace. There's no worry about whether you're going to eat, whether your life is in jeopardy, right? You bow down to the beast. Everybody wants to know. And that's what I find interesting. If you go online and there's tons of websites, you go on social media, everybody's got an opinion, you can watch videos, what's the market of these look like? And right now the big push is, you know, Bill Gates and Dr. Fauci, they're the ones coming out with the market of these, they've got this patent of this, this technology that goes on their hand and on their forehead. Is that the market of these customers? I want to know, so I don't get it. And for years I've heard different ideas on what the market of these you know what the mark of the beast is tied to? The worship of Satan. The worship of Satan of God. According to Revelation 14, verse 9, you can skip ahead. I give you permission. Skip ahead, 14, verse 9, and it clearly states that the mark of the beast is connected to the worship of Satan. Right? And here's the part that bothers me more. There are people that will sit at home. There are believers, okay, who will sit at home and they're worried more about what's going to go on their hand or their forehead than what is currently infiltrating their heart and their mind. They'll focus all about not getting some little tattoo or some thing put on their head, and they'll focus all about that, but they have no concern of whether or not what they've allowed into their family or into their home or into their workplace or into their heart, how that's affecting them and their loyalty to the Lord. They'll, they'll write paragraphs and pages and blog posts. They'll tell you all the things that you're to avoid. And then when you ask them what they're doing on Sunday, it's like, oh, I can't find a good place to go worship the Lord. I just, come on! You, you, you think that God wants you to have no fellowship, no relationship with Him whatsoever, and just make sure you don't get something put here or here. That's it. Well, you can worship the world indirectly worshiping the enemy you can worship all that you can worship wealth you can worship fame you can worship convenience you can worship all those other gods but just make sure that two things don't go here and here that's it it's not, you know what that sounds like to me that sounds like you believe that you'll be saved by your works and not by faith in Jesus. that's what that sounds like to me now maybe you want to put a different label on it and you want to recategorize it and put it into a different box but that doesn't sound like actual faith in Jesus Christ. And I'm sorry, listen, I've really wrestled. I had my son pray with me before I came here today because I was wrestling. I was like, Lord, this ain't going to be easy. I know there's going to be some people that get upset at the tour, probably going to hear about it. So Ms. Carolina's going to hear about it because she's a church secretary and all the emails are going to her. But, and there might be some people that get really offended by this this time. Because they want to know what the mark looks like. They haven't considered whether or not the mark of their life indicates that they're really not loyal to the Lord. Finally, verse 18. Because here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast for the number of men. The number of six is six. Calculate. In other words, here's what I would encourage you to do. Take a look at your heart. Take a look at your life. And ask yourself whether the marks of your life, whether those things have the mark of the Lord on them, or whether they have the mark of the enemy. The number of men, right, is what he says in Hebrews. It's a mark that is lesser than the perfect number of God. It's a mark that is lesser than God's perfection. It's man's best attempt to do something great and spiritual. And guess what it does? It falls short and needs to be our best attempt to do Christianity, look at that news for you guys. If you think that Christianity is working here in this country as we've redefined it and remade it, if you think all those big buildings and those great programs are doing much of the spirituality of this nation and this country, it's not. More and more people stop walking with the Lord on a regular basis. I don't care if 20,000 are going to the church. Here's what I do know, that more people are leaving the Christian faith than are joining it. Christianity is on the decline, and it's because those programs, they don't work. They exalt glitz and signs and glamour while compromising the truth of God's word. This week alone, this week alone, I, I know of 
two churches in our city that have closed down. One of which closes because the pastors and evidently maybe some of the staff were doing things that they weren't supposed to be doing. I know of a Calvary church who the pastor just stepped down. I know of a Calvary minister, ministry that just closes up with them and out of the It ain't working. And if we keep deceiving ourselves into thinking, no, no, that's what God wants. God wants his buildings, he wants the TV programs, he wants their preachers to be plastic and perfect and aesthetic. He doesn't want people teaching the truth of God's word anymore. He wants us to water it down so that we can be more seeker friendly and encourage more people to come out. He wants more altar calls. I find that to be interesting. The idea of the altar call, I understand what it does and how it encourages people to confess their faith. But how many altar calls do you read about Paul giving in the book of Acts? Or Peter? I'm saying because they get the altar call. I walked up front and did this. Repeated what the guy told me to repeat. And then I'm good, right? That's all I needed to do. You don't have to have a transformed heart. The Bible says that we believe and then we repent. Repentance isn't a work that leads to salvation, it's the product of the sincere heart turning to Christ in faith. To turn away. I'm tired of seeing the I'm tired of seeing the church of God spring. I'm tired of seeing Christians who have been walking with the Lord for decades all day up to close up shop. I'm tired of us thinking that it's about what we look like on the outside. I'm tired of all that people. This is not biblical. It's not the product, it's not the mark of the movement of the spirit of God. The spirit of God. I want this church to be led and marked by the spirit of God, not by the spirit of God. I want each believer that's a part of this church to have a transformed encounter with God. I want every single person that goes to this church to love the Word of God and to hold to the Word of God, not to me. Oh my God, I hate struck out of your children, guys. I hope you weren't following me. I hope so. Because if you are, you're in trouble. I hope you're following the Lord. You no more, no more fear. No more worry about us. This world needs the truth. They need the word of God. They don't need more false prophets. We need to start asking ourselves, is the God that we serve the God according to scriptures? Are we even serving the God? How, how do we know that we're serving the Lord? Listen, I want to tell you that, that Get off the cinema. It's a really good quote I read this week. From Watchman Nee. said, if you would test the character of anything, you only need to inquire that whether that thing leads you to God or leads to God. That's a good quote. Let me ask you a question. That thing that you chose to do Instead of what God called you to do this morning, maybe yesterday, or the day before, you know, the thing that you justified because you raised your hand one point about to you, you pray the prayer, the thing that you say, you know what, it's okay, nobody's perfect, that thing, did it lead you closer to God or further away? Sitting at home, does that lead you closer to God or does that lead you further away? It's time for us to ask those questions and honestly say, because it ain't working. It ain't working the way that it was. More and more, we're seeing people fall off. Why? Not because they're not listening to me or to our church. I love our church. We've got a great church. But it's because they're not going to the Word of God. They're not assessing. They don't care to assess. They don't. It, it, it's something. If we're going to be honest for a moment, it's, we, we just stop looking. Because we, we know that the assessment. Never avoid. I do this. My wife has been so diligent about, about um, eating healthy exercise lately. And every morning she gets on the scale, she assesses, she looks, how am I doing? All right, I'm doing good. She's got this calorie counter thing on her watch. It's awesome. You know what I do? I don't jump on that scale. I don't want the assessment. I know what it looks like right now. She's like, no, I'll just avoid that. I'll work a little harder today. I'll, I'll do something a little different. I'll just do more the assessment. You know, the you know what we do? We get special devotions that only say the nice things that we want to hear. 
the devotions for God's promises. What? I love this, right? We're talking about making God of our own image, right? You see the bumper stickers. God is love. When was the last time you saw a hashtag, God is wrath? Right? Because that's what's coming. The wrath of God is coming on this earth. And it's coming on those who reject and refuse to worship the God of the Bible. Listen, you can call him Jesus, but if he ain't the God of the Bible, he ain't going to be able to save you. You can say whatever you want about him, but if he's not the God that you know of according to the scripture, and he can't do nothing for you. To share this thought theory of scripture. Two areas of scripture. Matthew chapter 7, verse 22 and 23. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, you got to read down this way. Lord, Lord, they know him. They recognize him. Hey, you look, I know who you are. I've seen the pictures. You know, I got the everything else in my house. Lord, Lord. Have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons? Maybe you've done good things. Cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name. And when I declare to them, I'm sorry, and, and done many wonders in your name, Jesus says, and then I'll declare to them, I never knew you, apart from you, cross the wall. And they knew him. They did things for him. They said things about him. But they didn't know him. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22 to 25. Our admonition here this morning. This is what I want to leave every single person here this morning. As we talked about these marks, as we talked about the lies and the deceptions of the enemy, here's what Hebrews encourages us to let us draw near to the true heart and the soul of Jesus. My, my hope today, this morning, is that listen, if you haven't been walking with the Lord the way you know God is calling you, calling you to walk with Him, we just start today. But it's also an encouragement because I know many of you watching and here, and most of you guys who hear this, you are continue to follow. Drawing near to the Lord, He told you, sees, He loves, He knows, He recognizes. He'll be your strength. Though the enemy attacks, He'll still be the one that uplifts you and holds you. Don't don't deviate from walking with that God. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast the confession of our faith without wavering. For he who promised is faithful, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more since the see the day approaching. The day is approaching. When the Lord will return and we will rapture his church, or will we be called home? We leave this body and we leave this earth behind. If you see that day approaching, don't go weird. Don't get glamour. Don't let your heart deviate towards creating a God that there's your image, your likeness, your desire. Look to that God who truly saves. Look to the God who transforms hearts. To the grace of Jesus. The privilege of God. Give your life to Jesus Christ. Listen, if what I'm saying here today has caused you in your heart to question whether or not you know God, listen, now's the time to have that full assurance that's promised in the scripture. And it's simple. It, this isn't an altar call one because I don't have a stage or an altar for you to come up to. But here's the reality if you want to know that God, if that's the God that you wish to serve, and if that's the life that you wish to have, if you wish to have that full assurance, then it's simple. You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. You believe that He is God, that He died on the cross, and that He rose from the grave. And that grace that He will bestow to you, here's the promise from God, not from past one. That grace will transform you. That will only fact if that truth will transform your entire life. If that's you, then I'm going to invite you this morning as we close out the prayer. Bow your head with me now and pray this prayer with you. Lord Jesus, I invite you into my heart and into my life to be my God and to be my Savior. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. I believe that you rose three days later. And I believe that you are gone to prepare a place for me in heaven. I believe that you will bring me there with you. 
our faith sense from this day forward and forever. Lord, might you walk with me and be my son.